Margaret Simons, you're probably best now known as a biographer, um, books on Malcolm Fraser and, um, and Penny Wong most recently, and also as a, of course as a journalism um, researcher and being in universities for many years, um, working on the, the role of journalism in society. So why this book took you many months and it took you many miles, many kilometres as well. So what, uh, to, to do the research must have been intense as well. So what prompted the writing this book now? Well, it's always interesting to hear how one is regarded um, because I always think of myself as first and foremost a journalist. And one of the great privileges of being a journalist is that you get to uh, satisfy your own curiosity. Um, I was raised in South Australia, spent most of my weekends um, in the riverland of South Australia. And so some of my earliest memories of the Australian landscape were that river country. Um, one of my first jobs as a teenager was uh, cutting apricots in half in a uh, you know, boiling hot corrugated iron shed on the banks of the Murray. Um, and I was aware uh, as I grew older of the huge problems of water, um, initially blue-green algae outbreaks and problems with salinity. And I think in many ways, my, uh, I've been writing about the Murray my whole life. My first novel um, was set in a Murray River town. Um, I wrote The Meeting of the Waters um, nearly 20 years ago now, which was about the High Marsh Island Bridge affair. And I've also written essays on it for Griffith Review. Um, but the last thing I wrote on it, which was a substantial essay for Griffith Review, was just as the Murray-Darling Basin plan was being devised. And there was a lot of optimism about it, which I think was reflected in my essay. Um, and since then, I've been vaguely aware that the whole thing seemed to be falling apart or coming to grief without really understanding why or what the issues were. So I suggested the idea for this essay to Chris Vike at Black Ink, um, partly as a uh, reason to go out and satisfy my own curiosity. Yes, indeed, because we get stories through, and this week we've got uh, a couple more stories through about uh, the, the latest development. Um, New South Wales, are they in, are they out? Um, and it's very piecemeal, of course, but through your essay, the, it, it's, it's the big, big issues, obviously, big, big issues like this are always politicised, but the urgency of, of deciding action um, is, is, is through a political lens. And at the end of summer, you wrote, um, when this, this essay was finished, you wrote, the longer the drought goes on, um, the more uh, political or politicised it becomes. So what did, what did the drought revealed to you about the Murray-Darling Basin Plan? Well, the drought, of course, was terrible for everyone. Um, in the essay, I describe what it's like to drive through a landscape subjected to such terrible drought. I've seen droughts before, nothing like this one. And of course, as I was putting the final touches to the essay, in parts of the basin, the drought broke. But even though there aren't, there is now water, for example, in the Lower Darling, which there wasn't when I was there, um, it, um, it doesn't resolve the structural problems. And I think what the drought really highlighted is the structural problems in the way that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is implemented. It's not so much that it's a bad plan. In many ways, it's a miracle that we've got the plan, but there are real problems both with its design and also more uh, acutely with the way in which it's been implemented which result in a great deal of distrust among basin communities and farmers and indigenous owners. Um, the feeling that the water hasn't been shared fairly, that the process isn't robust. But if you say that it's a miracle we've got a plan at all, is that because of the difference between the state and the federal thing? Because obviously we need a plan. Mm. Yeah, well, you'd think that was obvious. <laughs> um, but, um, well, if you look around the world at um, places, other places that have problems with water as a scarce resource and a long river system and the need to share between um, users and competing interests, there aren't many places that have done it successfully. And on world terms, Australia doesn't stack up too badly for the fact that we do have a plan across several different jurisdictions um, and that it has had broad consent. 
but um, I think there's been a bit too much of self-congratulation on um, us having a plan and perhaps not, a much, not as much attention as there should have been to the implementation. It is difficult because, as you said, it involves all the basin states and territories. So Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, uh, South Australia, the ACT and the federal government basically all have to agree and cooperate in order to move forward. And as in other areas of our federation, that cooperation has been hard to come by and remains that way. One of the things that is amazing about this essay, it's just a beautiful thing because it's, um, you're able to insert a little of yourself into it, um, as well as giving us a, a terrific rundown of all the, um, the various com commissions, the reports, and the players, all the people who are involved in implementing this, you're actually in the car <laughs> and you're actually driving, first of all, to that middle point, um, then you drive north and then you drive south. But you, along the way, you say something really interesting and you say that people, there's a lot of good faith out there, Margaret. You obviously, you met a lot of people who are really trying very hard, but their idea of nature and the, and the environment is very, very different. How come um, that there's such a difference in our understanding of what the natural world is? Yeah, well, I think a lot of it is because people, and this is perhaps particularly the case for people along the Murray, as opposed to the Darling, um, they have a childhood memory. They have the memories of their parents and their grandparents as to how the river used to be. But of course, those memories don't extend back past the building of the Hume Dam and the Dartmouth Dam and the locks and the weirs and the beginning of irrigation. And so what they might think of how things used to be, they tend to equate with the natural state of the river. And in fact, of course, it's anything but because um, European settlers had already majorly messed with it <laughs> in order to support irrigation. And so you then get somebody like the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, which is the statutory office that has the job of managing water for the environment. They come in, they do their modelling on the basis of the rain and they model what it would be like if there was no irrigation and there were no dams in order to try and decide where to put the environmental water. And that could be completely out of kilter with how people remember it as being. And so the whole idea of what is the natural state um, is contested. and you know, the truth is that the natural state of the river, if by that we mean before European settlement, is well and truly out of reach. It's now a very plumbed landscape. I say in the essay, it's one of the most plumbed landscapes in the world. You know, we have great big um, engineering schemes to divert saline groundwater from the course of the Murray. We have um, endless pumps and weirs and, of course, the big public storage dams. You know, it is not a natural landscape. Um, and even if we ceased all irrigation today and demolished the dams, which of course nobody is going to do, it's not going to happen, even then it's been changed because of all the clearing of the um, of, uh, trees and so on that's happened across the basin. So the flow of water into the groundwater and into the river is fundamentally altered even before you start putting concrete into the river. I, yeah, and, and of course, then there's climate change, um, which is going to uh, bring another factor into uh, into all of this. I also grew up in Adelaide, and um, I also remember the, you know, how how much we were told as kids at school that the miracle of irrigation, you know, and how wonderful it was, and all this fruit that came from. I didn't cut the fruit, Margaret, but I can remember the um, the, the miracle of of Redmark and and Mildura, and um, and how proud we were of, of all those all those industries. And I guess there's a there's a there's a pride in that, but not many of us actually can get, when we live in cities, we can't actually seem to get our imagination out there. It's a tiny group of people, isn't it, who are fighting this? Well, yes. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the other reasons I wrote the essay, really, is I think for those who don't have a direct connection to the river, and even for many of those who do, it's really hard to understand. Water politics and water engineering are incredibly complex. And um, I mean, there are times I curse myself for attempting this when I was writing it. One of the things I was trying to do is to tell the whole story in a way that would make sense of the sort of the daily news stories, which we're increasingly getting. 
So somebody might hear about water theft, but they're not really clear where it is or how that works or how wide the extent of it is, or they might hear about a Commonwealth buyback of water and they think, huh, you know, what's a buyback? You know, it's, there's very few sort of pieces of journalism which actually explain it to somebody who hasn't been following it. And as a result, I think a lot of people in the cities turn off and it's too important for us to have that luxury. If we, I mean, I'm sure you're sitting there, you're probably wearing cotton at the moment. You know, that probably connects you to the Murray-Darling Basin. And there are people, when I was working on this, some of my city-based friends said, oh, why do we grow cotton in Australia? We should just stop growing cotton as though that was going to fix it. Well, of course, first, that shifts the environmental problem to other countries, many of which are less regulated and less um, environmentally aware than ourselves. Secondly, Australian cotton growers are actually among the most efficient in the world in terms of their use of water. And third, it's one of the most profitable crops. So if you actually want to make best use of water, cotton arguably has a claim there but then other people will say well we need a diverse farming sector we need you know we need to ensure that dairy farming survives for example or we need to ensure that we can still be self-sufficient in rice so how do we as a country weigh these things up when so many people are disconnected from the way in which their food and their clothing is produced sounds to me like you know the big the, 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 those several times when the fish died and there were extraordinary um, vision of um, belly up fish, um, just, you know, amazing vision. And I think people's, the idea of a river dying, I mean, I, I can't get my head around the idea of a river dying, but you do explain it very well about the, the kind of the seasonal use of water, um, the floodplains and then the water theft. And, and you met some, I wonder whether that, that those images, uh, which did hit home to a lot of people and then we just got on with, you know, city lives. But I wonder if, if that taught some of the people you met who are very, very, um, extraordinary people that you do little pen portraits of, did that teach them something about what they need, the message they need to get out or how to get their message out to the, the mass of people? Well, I think it's one of the most telling stories in the essay myself, um, how the fish kill story got out to Australia and ultimately to the world, because it went right around the world. I think a lot of people don't really realise where the Menindee fish kill happened, but it's a very remote location, the sort of place that, you know, grey nomads might get to if they're intrepid. And certainly I felt intrepid going there. You know, a little collection of towns, some of them with only a few dozen people in them. Um, fairly dicky internet access, not much, you know, reception on your mobile phone's pretty confined. And the people in this part of the Darling River had been trying for ages to get attention to the fact that the river was dying and it took the fish kill but they it's a mixed story partly the ABC in Broken Hill which sent out its reporter who spent many days laboring in the heat among the smell of dying fish but also their own social media efforts they were taking photos of the fish kill and posting them to Facebook and before they knew it they had this massive story and the issues they've been trying to get attention to for ages were suddenly world news they did learn a lot from that. Those, the locals there, including some of the ones I write about, now have the uh, mobile numbers of the nation's leading journalists on their mobiles, and they're quite frequently in touch. I got some photos from one of them just the other day. Nicer photos this time of water in places that were dry when I was there. So they will never again be without voice, but whether they will able, be able to get real attention and real reform is another issue. Yeah, I guess that I came, I came through it thinking um, it was insoluble. Um, it's an interesting word to use, isn't it, for a problem like this? But also that, and then it rains and there's a little bit of hope and we see some dirty brown water in the Darling meeting the Murray and there's a, there's a little bit of hope. Are you going to follow up on this? Are you, are you keep, I imagine you're keeping track. Yes, I'm certainly keeping an eye on it all. I'm, in a freelance, I'm a freelance journalist, so I need a commission to write about it again, obviously, but I'm certainly keeping in touch with recent developments. Quite a few of the inquiries, which I wrote about at the end of the essay, have now reported. Um, one of the most important, which is the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission's report on um, auto trading, we're waiting for at the moment, but that will be very important. Um, so no, I'm keeping in touch with it. 
I mean, when you say it's hopeless, I don't think it is. I think we can rescue it. I think we have to have a clear eye on what we're trying to do. Um, as I said before, we can't take it back to how it used to be. And if we sort of think that we can, then we'll be endlessly disappointed. What we're trying to do is balance, and they're often put as opposing forces, but in fact they're not, the needs of the environment to keep the river alive in every sense with um, a substantial economic and industrial, agri-industrial agri uh, complex. And, um, you know, that's not easy. And at the moment, the problems are with implementation, with data. We don't know enough about how much water there is and where it is. Um, and there need to be huge improvements to that. You know, one, one thing would be to establish a politically independent body to oversee the whole process, something like a reserve bank for water, if you like, that was out of reach of the politicians, which I think in some ways would be quite a relief for the National Party in particular, which is so conflicted at the moment in trying to get good policy up because of its deep connections to the industry. I think it would be quite a relief in some ways for uh, the National Party, which nearly always has the water portfolios in both the state and federal government, to actually have it taken off them to some extent. <laughs> So how would that happen? How would, where would the pressure come from to convince people that's a good idea? I think the pressure is there now, actually, and, it, and the drought has added to that. Um, there is a lot of criticism of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, which is the Commonwealth government body that manages the river on behalf of the state. Um, I think by the time we see all these uh, different inquiries land, the need for a more politically independent and transparent process will be clear. At the moment, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority answers to a ministerial council, which includes the water ministers for each state. Um, it's interesting to see with the National Cabinet now being established instead of the um, Chogan, Commonwealth Heads of Government, you know, that has clear potential applicability to the Murray-Darling Basin. There's a few other issues they'll be looking at first. But, you know, it is, it is still within reach to improve this process. We're certainly better off with the plan than without it. Um, there is no alternative game on the table for improving things, but huge attention has to be given to improving it. I would like to see the most politically active irrigation groups stopping the special pleading for their own industries and actually beginning to think at a more national level about the long-term sustainability, political and environmental and economic sustainability of what they're doing. At the moment, you tend to have the cotton industry playing very hard for their interests and more recently you've got people like the can the plan processors along the Murray playing very hard for their interests and they're not talking to each other much and that's really you know if we want to move forward we're going to have to not crumble to either side and try and get people into conversation. I'm wondering whether because we've begun to listen to Indigenous people um, about fire and we're learning um, you know, that, and that to me is a, a huge move forward and we're getting good writing about that. Is there, a, um, is there Indigenous knowledge about water use that we could tap into? Tap into, excuse me, <laughs> but is there, is there Indigenous <laughs> knowledge? Certainly, and I mean, in a long process where lack of consultation is a, you know, a, a continuous theme across all the groups involved, I don't think there's any doubt that the Indigenous uh, traditional owners have been shafted most of all. Um, and I think every inquiry has acknowledged that uh, Indigenous people might have been consulted, but it hasn't been a very productive consultation or fake consultation, as one of the traditional owners I spoke to put it, where they get called along to a meeting, usually no funding available to help them attend meetings, they spend hours being consulted, only to see no account at all taken of their interests. Um, so, yeah, that's been a huge problem. One of the lovely things, in you, and it comes up the bit, uh, several times, is when you're driving out there, <laughs> and there you are along these, but the Hay Plain is a, is a place that is, is extraordinary, um, and it does change you, I think, to drive into those spaces. And the, the, um, the hand on the wheel, and I confess I've started doing it here, and I'm not very far in the country, Bendigo is, you know, city, really, but the, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that 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 yeah. um that you must have enjoyed your time out there. I think Margaret. Anyway, even though it's a you know a tough call, you sound as though and the pubs 
the discussions, the the, the, the um, conversations in pubs. It is a it's a great thing to do. Well, yes, and the research was, you know, hugely fascinating. A great privilege, um, and as you say, fun. Although very sad at times writing it and you know I'm, I'm reassured by the feedback I'm getting which suggests I did succeed in writing it in a way that makes these issues you know rescues them really from the abstracts and from the experts and makes the issues and their importance evident to a broad readership and if I've succeeded in that then I have succeeded in what I set out to do so um mm. I think you changed the title. This is uh, sort of almost um, my, my last question because when I first knew you were writing this, I think it was called something else, and it's quite a bold thing to call it Crimea River. I think, um, and you have to be a certain age to remember the, the song anyway. But um, but that sort of reinvests it with um, the pathos, the pathos that the Lower Darling could disappear. Um, is that that was that? Tell me about the title, Margaret. Well, I'm, I'm hopeless at titles, Rosemary. I, I don't think I've chosen a single title for any of my books <laughs> because I'm really bad at it. And this one too I, wasn't my choice. Um, Chris Spike, the editor of the quarterly essay, um, pitched me a number of options and um, I chose this one from his list. Um, but I don't think I could have done that on my own. So the courage is his, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, but, but if I could get just finally to that to that pathos, the idea of a river dying. Do you think when obviously when you speak to the people along the, the Murray Darling, their um, emotion is enormous. When you come back into the city, do we just go, oh, "Gee, that's bad," and not actually hear the, the the you know the river is dying? I mean, how do we get this this reality in front of people? Well, to take it more broadly, I think it's one of <clears throat> pardon me, the big problems that underlies many aspects of Australia today is the divide between those who earn their livelihoods directly from the resources of the earth, from the country, and those who don't. And, you know, I, I'd include mining in that, for example, and the divide that we see in voting between mining communities and, and city dwellers but it's true of agriculture as well. We, we've stopped talking to each other. We've moved from being a nation where our dominant narrative, our dominant poetry, our dominant stories came from the bush, from the land, to one where um, those stories are still being told perhaps, but they're not heard outside those communities. And I really think that if we're going to move forward and particularly tackle issues which are raised by the current COVID crisis around food security and around um, how's Australia to move forward in a time of increasing geopolitical strife? You know, we're going to have to address those. I think rural and regional policy, it would be great if both sides of politics would actually develop sensible rural and regional policy and we can have a political debate and contest over that. But we would be the better for it, no matter who wins. I do think that our, a lot of our um, just politicians... Um, do subscribe to this idea that the bush is a bit of a joke and you get away with being a bit of a dag out in the bush and you can say stupid things and you discovered that in fact those of many of the people um mostly men who are um, farming out there or who are working out there uh, know their stuff and i think one of them at one stage says to you you know they just don't listen or you know it's not as though we're we're buffheads who aren't going to try to make this work um it, we're, is it is it is one of the problems that we have this identity australian identity you know dad and dave you're out in the bush and you're a bunch of of, of uh, ignoramuses is, is that you know we're almost um victims of our own identity making Yes, yes, I think there's a stereotype among, um, you know, in the suburban lefties, I guess, that everybody in the bush is, is a conservative knuckle dragger, maybe not very well educated, etc., etc. And also that things are somehow unchanging, whereas I say in the essay, rural Australia has been through far more change in the last two decades than the cities. Uh, the pace of change takes your breath away. And that's one of, the, one of the background reasons why reform is so difficult because people are already dealing with whiplash, really, with the speed of how things have changed. 
across all sorts of things, not only water politics, um, marketing of agricultural commodities, all sorts of things. Um, and I don't think city people clock that at all. They sort of think, you know, somewhere or the other out there, Clancy's still, you know, riding across the overflow, maybe on a motorbike instead of a horse, but, you know, that life hasn't changed. And of course, it's changed enormously um, and, and will continue to change. But the national conversation, this is a fault of journalism in some ways, the national conversation um, has become impoverished because we no longer talk to each other. And, uh, and there's a fair bit of hostility. I think farmers suspect yeah. that city people don't like them and the reverse is also true. Yeah, and with, with good reason because of, the, because of what they hear back. Um, look, thanks, Margaret. I think this is a really important essay. Um, I'm, I, I'm really grateful to you because it certainly, mind you, there's some amazing names for organisations <laughs> around water. Um, so I had to get my head around that a bit. But it really does bring us up, up to uh, up to a little to speed on on the ideas behind it, important ideas. So thanks for doing it, and well done for, for getting in the Ute, <laughs> heading down the highway. So we'll, we'll say goodbye like that. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Margaret. Look forward to the next to the next work. Thank you. Thanks, Rosemary. Bye.